Today, we are going to talk about the most prolific serial killer ever in the United States of America. Some of this story will be explicit, so listener discretion is advised. We are taught to read clues all around us to keep ourselves safe from people who would do us harm. Well, what happens when the person who wants to kill you removes those clues and lulls you into a false sense of security? This is exactly what happened to almost six dozen women when they met the Green River Killer. I'm John Dodson. This is The Secret Sense. Our story today begins on February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah, where Mary Rita Ridgway gives birth to the second of three boys. Her husband was Thomas Newton Ridgway, who was a bus driver, while Mary worked as a sales clerk at the local J.C. Penney. The couple would name this new baby Gary Leon Ridgway. The family moved to SeaTac, Washington in 1960, and young Gary began attending the Chinook Junior High School and then moved on to Thai High School. Gary was not great in school. In fact, he had been held back in two different years. But Gary exceeded in being socially stimulating. He never had any trouble getting a girlfriend or getting a date, community college classmate Alan Sample told the Tacoma News Tribune. A somewhat smallish kid is how David Alfred, his high school football coach, described him to that same paper. He had wispy hair and was nondescript. Gary had never gotten in any trouble as a youth, but slowly some signs of what we now know as the triad of psychopathy began to emerge. Gary continued to wet his bed until he was the age of 13. He played around with arson and he tortured small animals. In this particular act, he murdered a cat by shutting it in a freezer. Many now believe that Gary Ridgway's evil had always been there. He was just so damn good at hiding it, no one had any suspicions. Gary was the middle child, and he definitely was not the favorite, either. The favorite child was Gregory, his older brother by one year. Gregory was the most accomplished of the brothers. He went to college for physics at a pretty nice school, and I guess we have to compare that to Gary, who was said to have an IQ in the low 80s, which would put him in the bottom of the low normal portion of the human population. One thing that always got Gary upset was when he thought they might make him ride the short bus to school. And just to explain to anyone who does not get this statement, the short bus is actually that, a shorter version of the big yellow school bus. But its purpose was typically to pick up very special children, those with special needs, and some with mental deficiencies. So to say you ride the short bus to a person is a read on their intelligence. While how Gary got along with his siblings was one thing, his mother, Mary Rita, was a whole other thing. Because Rita stirred in Gary one of the most focused Oedipus complexes I have ever seen. You see, Gary was sexually attracted to his mother, and because of this arousal, it made him feel disdain for her as well. So let's go back to what I mentioned earlier about Gary wetting his bed until he was 13. Every time that Gary would wet his bed, Rita would pull him out of the bed and drag him to the bathroom. There, Sometimes only in her bra and panties, she would scrub Gary's genital area with her own hands. This extremely inappropriate 
intimacy between Gary and his mother at the age of 13 led to some of Gary's feelings towards his mother. Rita would have the most bizarre conversations with her son when he was just a small boy. Remember I said that she was a sales clerk at J.C. Penney? Well, she would work in the men's clothing section, and she would come home and tell Gary about men she had done suit fittings for, while measuring their inseam down on her knees in front of these men. They would get erections, and Rita would describe them to Gary in explicit detail, even down to what the man's crotch smelled like. Rita also dealt out forms of corporal punishment to her son Gary, hitting him with belts and sticks, even for the most minor infractions. And she didn't reserve this behavior just for Gary. Oh no. Rita also constantly yelled at and berated her husband as well. It was around this age when Gary was about 13 that he also began fantasizing about murdering his mother. Gary's father just took all of the abuse his wife could dole out. She would scream at Thomas at the dinner table and then just pick up a plate and smash it over his head. Gary's dad would not even react. He would just stand up and walk away. I'm not sure if this was because of how scared he was of Rita, or if he just didn't give a crap about her or their marriage. But seeing these types of interactions between his parents also changed and warped Gary's views on people in society. The family's home was close to the Pacific Highway South, a street in town which was well known for having many sex workers on the street. Gary's father hated this about where they lived and quite often would make loud proclamations about how much he hated the sex workers everywhere. Thomas finally gets another job at a mortuary and he would come home from work and tell Gary stories about how one of his co-workers would have sex with the dead bodies. I think it's obvious that these two were not going for parents of the year. Now 1965, and Gary is 16 years old. He sees a kid, just about the age of a kindergartner. The kid is dressed up like a cowboy, and he is close to some woods behind his home, playing with a stick. Gary walks up to the boy. Hey, you want to go help me build a fort in the woods? Gary asked the small boy. And of course, he does. He's dressed up like a cowboy. This kid is up for some adventure. So Gary and the kid make their way into the woods. The next thing the kid says is, Why did you kill me? Blood now flowed out of the child's midsection, down his leg, and into his small cowboy boots. The knife Gary had used was unfolded from the sheath that was in his pocket. The one stab had punctured the boy's liver. Why did you kill me? He asked, and Gary simply laughed, turned to walk away, and said, I always wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. The boy survived this attack, but this was the breaking point. When Gary Ridgway was no longer a victim and instead became a predator, and monster, the same predator and monster he is to this very day. Because Gary was not familiar to this little boy, the boy could never identify his attacker, and Gary never got in trouble for this attack while still in his youth. But this story is later confirmed by Gary himself. When Gary graduated from high school in 1969, he was already 20 years old. He married his 19-year-old girlfriend, Claudia Craig. He enlisted in the United States Navy and was deployed to serve in the Vietnam War, working on a supply ship which engaged in some combat. 
Gary, while in Vietnam, began to frequent sex workers to get some relief because his wife was on the other side of the world. While engaging in these actions, Gary contracted gonorrhea, and this made him mad, especially at the sex workers who he felt were to blame. But he continued to frequent the sex workers even after this, and also continued to have unprotected sex with them. About a year after being married and shipped off to war, Gary returns home and discovers that his wife has also been unfaithful while he was away. So Gary gets really mad because she cheated and calls her a whore, and they get a divorce. In 1972, Gary is back in Washington and gets a job painting vehicles. He also gets married again, this time to Marcia Winslow. Now his first wife spent almost no time around Gary while they were actually married because he was deployed most of the time. But Marcia was not so lucky. Things started off with small, strange requests, like Gary liked to have sex in strange places, like in the woods, by the Green River, all places he would later use as dump sites for his victims. It was at this time that Gary's appetite for sex really took off. Marcia says that he wanted it, or needed it all of the time from her. They had sex three, four, five times per day. Because of all of the sex, guess what happened? Marcia got pregnant. And after baby Matthew was born, for the shortest amount of time, the couple could not have sexual intercourse. And this made Gary's blood boil. He just could not handle not being able to have sex at any given moment. And because Gary always needs someone to blame for his anger, he focused that anger directly at his newborn son. After all, it was Matthew's fault that his wife was out of commission. After the couple would commence having coitus, Gary would do strange things to become aroused. He would jump out and scare Marcia or say disturbing things to her while they were in action. He also started to choke Marcia during sex, which also started to scare her. Because of the mounting trouble in their home and marriage, Marcia divorces Gary and runs for the hills. Gary will blame most of his rage in his future life on the way his marriage ended and blaming Marcia for a lot of his own shortcomings. In fact, Gary even says that he thinks if he had simply killed Marcia, that that would have been cathartic enough that he would not have had to even kill any other women. They were all substitutes for her. Gary had become religious during his second marriage, proselytizing door to door, reading the Bible aloud at work and at home. He would also frequently cry after sermons or reading the Bible. Some have speculated that Gary Ridgway was torn between his lusts and his staunch religious beliefs. But whatever was happening between his head and his heart, this is the time in Gary Ridgway's life when he starts his murderous spree that will make him one of the most prolific serial killers of all time. It is believed that throughout the 1980s and 90s, Gary Ridgway may have murdered a minimum of 71 young women near Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. Gary is not sure, because as he has stated, he just simply lost count. A vast majority of the murders took place from 1982 through 1984. Most of his victims are believed to have either been sex workers or runaways, whom he picked up along the Pacific Highway South. The same road his dad used to complain about because of all the sex workers everywhere. Gary's typical modus operandi was to pick up the girls on the road. 
he would show the girls his ID, with his thumb strategically placed over his name so they could not identify him by name. He would also have a picture of his baby son Matthew in his wallet, placed purposely so that the girls could see the photo and add to his trust factor. And just to be over the top, he would even leave a couple of Matthew's Star Wars toys scattered on the back seat of his car. Look at that sweet dad. He must be a safe guy to get in the car with. And then, Gary would bring the girls home with him, where the charade continued. He would show the girls Matthew's bedroom, and this would just make the girls relax. This divorced man with this sweet kid can't be bad. He could not possibly be the serial killer who's been on the news. Gary even said that he was asked over 50 times by girls he picked up if he was, in fact, the Green River Killer. Gary would have sex with these girls, and his last move would always be to take them from behind. And while back there, Gary would wrap his forearm around a girl's neck then pulled back with his other arm, as hard as he could, until they died from asphyxiation. On July 18th, the same day as one of Gary's brother's birthdays, Gary goes out and picks up a girl, with Matthew in the car with him. He took her out to the South Airport area and took her into the woods and murdered her. Gary says, he doesn't think his son could see when he was murdering the girl, but that only ever happened one time. Almost all of his victims were killed either in his home, his truck, or in a secluded area. The bodies would be dumped in wooded areas around the Green River, the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport, and other dump sites within South King County. The bodies would be left nude, sometimes they would be posed, and they were left in clusters. The bodies would not be left in easily discovered areas, not only because Gary did not want to get caught, but because Gary also discovered that he enjoyed necrophilia. Gary would return to his prized bodies over and over again to have sexual intercourse with them. Gary would later say that he did not find necrophilia more satisfying than normal sex, but having sex with the deceased reduced his need to kill new victims. How considerate of you, Gary. Because of Gary's practice of using his tried-and-true dump sites, most of the bodies were not discovered until only skeletons remained. In early 1984, the King County Sheriff's Office formed the Green River Task Force to begin investigating these murders. So far, they had found 13 victims, all either sex workers or runaways. And within the area being searched by the task force, there was another 24 women who had gone missing. The task force included Robert Keppel and Dave Reichert, who would sometimes interview incarcerated serial killer Ted Bundy in 1984. Bundy would offer his opinions on the psychology, motivations, and behavior of the killer they were looking for. It was all very Silence of the Lambs feeling, at least in my head. Bundy even suggested that the killer would revisit his dump sites to have sex with his victims, which turned out to be true. He also suggests that if they find a fresh victim in a fresh gravesite, they should do a stakeout and wait for him to return. Also involved with this case was John E. Douglas, who is famous for being an FBI special agent and unit chief. He was one of the original FBI criminal profilers and on the Netflix series Mindhunter, actor Jonathan Groff portrays Johnny Douglas. He developed a criminal profile used by the Green River 
Task Force. Five of the first victims were found by the Green River, which gave the killer the moniker, the Green River Killer. He then started using his other favorite areas. By the end of 1984, the killer had murdered over 40 women. Then the numbers slowed down dramatically. Gary Ridgway was arrested in 1982 and again in 2001 on charges related to prostitution. And in 1984, he became a suspect in the Green River killings. Gary was given the always reliable polygraph test, which he passed with flying colors. On April 7th of 1987, police took hair and saliva samples from Gary. But it was 1987 and DNA wasn't a thing. The task force keeps looking into Gary for this case, but they can't really find anything on him. Then they start to notice his gas receipts. And they figure out that he's buying way more gas than he should need if he is only driving back and forth to work, something Gary had told the task force when he was interviewed. Along with this, Gary had no reliable alibi for any of the murders they had talked to him about. Next, the task force put Gary's picture into a photo lineup to witnesses who had been interviewed and several identified him as a person they had seen around the time some of the girls had gone missing. Based on this evidence, and from everything from 1984 and 1987, the task force is given a search warrant for Gary's house. But they end up with nothing. And Gary Ridgway may have had a low IQ, but he had no intentions of getting caught. He actively tried to prevent himself from becoming a suspect. He drove two of his victims all the way to Portland, Oregon. He would purposely contaminate his own dump sites with other people's used gum and cigarette butts. He would place materials with other people's handwriting on it and would even include travel maps or brochures to make it appear that maybe this was just someone passing through town. Gary was a very cautious killer. He chose people who would not be missed, or if they were missed, they were disregarded sex workers who police wouldn't spend their time looking for. But beyond that, he would take precautions, like if a girl scratched him, he would cut off all of her fingernails. And he did not keep trophies from his victims like we see in so many other serial killer cases. What he did instead was he would take a piece of jewelry from a victim. Then he would just leave it on the sink at work in the women's bathroom. The goal was that someone where he worked would take the jewelry and keep it. Then whenever he would see a woman at work wearing one of his victim's items, it would make him aroused. Sometime around 1985, Gary met Judith Mousen, who became his third wife in 1988. Judith later said that when she moved into Gary's house while they were still dating, there was no carpeting. Detectives later told her there had been no carpeting because Gary had used it to move a dead body. Judith said Gary would start leaving for work early in the morning telling her that he had overtime to work. She now realizes that this was most likely a ruse and that he was actually committing some of his murders during this time. Judith had not suspected Gary of any crimes until she was contacted by the police in 1987. Additionally, she had never even heard the term Green River Killer because she did not watch the news. Author Penny Moorhead interviewed Gary Ridgway in prison, and he said while he was in the relationship with Judith Malson, his kill rate went down and that he truly loved her. 
Of his 49 known victims, only three were killed after he married Judith. Judith told a local television reporter, I feel I have saved lives by being his wife and making him happy. The samples which had been collected in 1987 were later tested and subjected to DNA profiling. This provided the task force with the evidence for an arrest warrant for Gary Leon Ridgway. On November 30th, 2001, the task force executed the warrant while Gary was at work at the Kenworth Truck Factory, where he worked as a painter. He was arrested on suspicion of the murder of four women, nearly 20 years earlier. The DNA evidence conclusively linked semen left in the victims to the saliva swab police had taken in 1987. The four victims named in the original indictment were Marcia Chapman, Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines, and Carol Ann Christensen. Three more victims, Wendy Caulfield, Deborah Bonner, and Deborah Estes, were added to the indictment after a forensic scientist identified microscopic spray paint spheres as a specific brand and composition of paint used at the Kenworth factory during this specific time frame when these victims were killed. Early in August of 2003, Seattle Television News reported that Gary had been moved from a maximum security cell at King County Jail to an Airway Heights minimum medium security level tank. Other news reports stated that his lawyers, led by Anthony Savage, were closing a plea bargain that would spare him the death penalty in return for his confession to a number of the Green River murders. On November 5, 2003, Gary Ridgway entered a guilty plea to 48 charges of aggravated first-degree murder as part of a plea bargain that would spare him execution in exchange for his cooperation in locating the remains of his victims and providing additional details. In his statement accompanying his guilty plea, Gary explained that he had killed all of his victims inside of King County, Washington and that he had transported and dumped the remains of the two women near Portland to confuse the police. Deputy Prosecutor Jeffrey Baird noted in court that the deal contained the names of 41 victims who would not be the subject of State v. Ridgeway if it were not for the plea agreement. King County Prosecuting Attorney Norm Malang explained his decision to make the deal. We could have gone forward with seven counts, but that is all we could have ever hoped to solve. At the end of that trial, whatever the outcome, there would have been lingering doubts about the rest of these crimes. This agreement was the avenue to the truth. And in the end, the search for the truth is still why we have a criminal justice system. Gary Ridgway does not deserve our mercy. He does not deserve to live. The mercy provided by today's resolution is directed not at Ridgeway, but toward the families who have suffered so much. On December 18th of 2003, King County Superior Court Judge Richard Jones sentenced Gary Ridgeway to 48 life sentences with no possibility of parole, plus one additional life sentence to be served consecutively. He was also sentenced to an additional 10 years for tampering with evidence for each of the 48 victims, adding an additional 480 years to his 48 life sentences. Gary led prosecutors to three bodies in 2003. On August 16th of that year, the remains of a 16-year-old girl found near Emanclaw, Washington, just 40 feet from State Route 410, 
were pronounced as belonging to Pammy Annette Avent, who had been believed to be a victim of the Green River Killer. The remains of Marie Malvar and April Buttram were found in September of 2003. On November 23rd of 2005, the Associated Press reported that a weekend hiker found the skull of one of the 48 women Ridgeway admitted to murdering in his 2003 plea bargain with the King County prosecutors. The skull of another victim, Tracy Winston, who was 19 when she disappeared from Northgate Mall on September 12, 1983, was found on November 20, 2005, by a man hiking in a wooded area near Highway 18 in Issaquah, southeast of Seattle. Gary Ridgway has confessed to more confirmed murders than any other American serial killer. Over a period of five months of police and prosecutor interviews, he confessed to 48 murders, 42 of which were on the police's list of probable Green River victims. On February 9, 2004, county prosecutors began to release the videotaped records of Gary's confessions. In one taped interview, he initially told investigators that he was responsible for the deaths of 65 women. In another taped interview with Reichert on December 31, 2003, Ridgway claimed to have murdered 71 victims and confessed to having sex with them before killing them, a detail which he did not reveal until after his sentencing. In his confession, he acknowledged that he targeted sex workers because they were easy to pick up and that he hated most of them. He confessed that he had sex with his victims' bodies after he murdered them, but claimed he began burying the later victims so he could resist the urge to commit necrophilia. Gary Widgeway later said that murdering young women was his career. He was placed in solitary confinement at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla in January of 2004. On May 14, 2015, he was transferred to the USP Florence High, a high-security federal prison east of Cannon City, Colorado. In September 2015, after a public outcry and discussions with Governor Jay Inslee, Corrections Secretary Bernie Warner announced that Ridgway would be transferred back to Washington to be more easily accessible for open murder investigations. Ridgway was returned by chartered plane to Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla from USP Florence High on October 24, 2015. Was Judith Mousen right. Did her marrying Gary Ridgway save countless lives? Well, we may never know, because as much as Gary loves to talk, I, for one, am sure he is still living in the middle of the circle, where the secret sits. I'm John Dodson, and please take a moment of your time and share the show with your friends and family. We would truly appreciate it. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dotson. Original artwork provided by Tony Lay.